This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Well, I'm very happy to introduce uh, one of our colleagues here at the ANS, um, somebody who uh, most of the time is, is sort of working behind the scenes. Um, so uh, it's, it's really a, a pleasure to, to bring him to the forefront and, and to um, let him show all of you what he does. Um, Ethan Gruber is our director of data science, and he is um, so somebody who is a pretty key player here um, in the fact that he's responsible for developing all of the society's digital collections, you know, such as um, our library site, Mantis, um, the archive site, Archer, as well as these uh, research information systems, uh, such as Ochre and uh, Hellenistic Royal Coinages, for which we've been getting a number of, of Hellenists, or sorry, uh, National Endowment for the Humanities grants. Um, <clears throat> Ethan um, is here today to talk to you about another uh, uh, um, uh, online uh, tool that he's uh, heavily involved in, nomismod.org. Um, which I'll let him <laughs> explain what it is and what it does. Uh, but um, with, with that, Ethan, I'll, I'll just let you uh, go ahead. So welcome everyone and enjoy. All right, thank you. All right, so, all right, so you see the presentation? Yep. All right, so, um, yeah, so I'm gonna introduce to you uh, nomisma.org today, which is really a foundational piece of infrastructure that the ANS and a lot of other projects uh, rely on for their um, user interface functionality. So it's really, um, I would say it is um, an international collaboration between a, a number of institutions to define the intellectual concepts of numismatics according to linked open data principles. And linked open data, and uh, I'm not going to get too much further into this because in the um, in the, the this uh, presentation, I have a few links to papers that you can read up on. But essentially, it is um, defining the semantics of intellectual concepts and numismatics following um, URIs, which is an addressable uh, URL that you can access on the web. And um, if you go to a URL uh, for numisma.org, there is some human readable information and I'll show some screenshots of what that looks like. But underlying this is uh, machine readable data and um, links uh, together different information systems that kind of interact with each other to create um, a system that allows us to do a lot of really interesting and complicated uh, research questions. So um, in addition to numismo.org being a sort of a thesaurus of intellectual um, numismatic terminologies, it's also a standardized data model for representing numismatic information on the web. And it's also a centralized aggregator for a lot of different types of numismatic data sets. So I'll provide a, a really brief uh, introduction to the types of data sets that we actually have in numisma. So first we have collections themselves. So this is uh, the ANS collection, and um, at this point, I think there are about 50 different museum and archaeological data sets aggregated into Numisma. Um, of course, many of you will know that the ANS collection online is uh, published through our database called Mantis, um, which is numismatics.org slash search. I'm sure many of you have used it. So if you go to a record for a coin, this particular coin is uh, um, uh, a coin, an ass of, of Trajan, and it links to uh, Ochre, to RIC, Volume 2, Trajan uh, 492. And this is what a page in, in Mantis looks like for a coin. Um, we also have typologies in different, um, uh, in different areas of numismatics. We started off with Ochre. Um, originally, we published the first version in, in 2012 and then got the grant from the NEH in 2014 to develop the resource fully. 
Um, so there's online coins of the Roman Empire and coinage of the Roman Republic online, as well as Hellenistic royal coinages, which includes uh, Seleucid, Ptolemaic, um, the coins struck in the name of Alexander, as well as Antigonid coinage. Uh, I think within the next month or two, we should see the Bactrian and Indo-Greek uh, typologies go online as well under this rubric. There are other typologies online as well that, um, that are aggregated into Namisma. Not all of them are published by the ANS. So recently we incorporated Iron Age Coins in Britain, which is a major project uh, from Oxford uh, University. And um, um, there's also Oscar, which is a Swiss typology of, of Swiss coins from uh, the end of the Roman Empire, essentially, until modern day. So if I go to Ochre, and uh, this is the first page you get in the browse, um, the browse page, and it's just basically a listing of RIC numbers. Uh, you can browse and search and, and do all sorts of things with this interface. If I click on a record for Augustus 37A, you see that there's some typological information on the left and a, a map on the right that includes a few individual find spots that correspond to coins from the portable antiquity scheme, as well as some points for coin hoards. And uh, below the map, you see some examples of this coin type from collections that have been aggregated into the MISMA. Um, there are hoard resources as well. So there's um, inventory of Greek coin hoards is published through coinhoards.org, which is an ANS project. And we're also publishing Chris Lockyer's database of coin hoards of the Roman Republic. Uh, another major resource that's online uh, is at Oxford, which is Coin Hoards of the Roman Empire, although it is um, not really integrated into the MISMA, unfortunately. So there's uh, limited interactions that we can do with this database through our own system. Uh, this is a page uh, for Coin Hoard and Coin Hoards of the Roman Republic. So uh, much like coin types, there's some um, metadata about the hoard, a, a map showing the distribution of mints and uh, a list of contents and so forth. Uh, we also have some 30,000 coins from the Portable Antiquities Scheme integrated into the MISMA. Uh, a large portion of these, actually, I think it's 60,000 now. So about, I think it's 30,000 Roman Imperial coins and about 30,000 Iron Age coins, so it's quite a lot of information. And each of these would have find spots that typically link to the parish level in the UK. And that's what a page in uh, the PAS looks like. So when we aggregate all of these into the MISMA, so we're able to link from coin specimens to hordes, coins to types, types to collections, and so forth, we can build a a network graph of relations between all of these sorts of information systems and uh, perform a lot of complex queries with them. So I think uh, for a numismatic uh, audience, um, defining a coin type is fairly obvious, but um, for example, this is uh, a coin um, that depicts um, or is minted in the name of Alexander the Great, although it's a posthumous coin. Uh, it's minted in Aratus, which is uh, located in Phoenicia. It's silver, it's a tetradram. On the obverse is Heracles. On the reverse, there's a legend. And then there's also a, a monogram, which is defined as a monogram 118 within um, Price's book on um, coins minted in the name of Alexander. And uh, Zeus is depicted on the reverse and so on and so forth. So when mapping to Namisma concepts, uh, which are reusable identifiers on the web, we can replace all of these uh, names for people or places or monograms with the URI. So um, there's a URI in namisma.org for Alexander the Great. And when you combine all of these typological attributes together, uh, they correspond to price 3309, which is from uh, the coinage of, in the name of Alexander the Great, uh, published by Martin Price in 1991. So there's a, a URI for price 3309 within the Pella project. 
and um, the underlying machine readable data for price 3309 links to namisma.org concepts for all of those categories. So at Namisma, the front page uh, looks like this, as you can see. And as I defined earlier, it's a collaborative project to define the concepts of numismatics. If we go to the web page for Alexander the Great on Namisma, you see there's uh, on the top left, there are different languages and uh, different uh, Alexander the Great in different languages, which uh, enables us to build multilingual interfaces in Hellenistic royal coinages and ochre. Uh, there's a definition. Um, there's a role that defines Alexander as an authority in the Macedonian kingdom, which is defined by another in the Misma URI with a start and end date, a start date of 336 BC and an end date of 323. And at the right, you see there's a map showing all of the hordes that contained coins of Alexander the Great, and the blue points are all mints that produced coins, um, either under his own authority or his stated authority. And I'll get into some of the nitty gritty details of how we actually generate maps like this uh, with Namisma. If we go to the web page for Aratus, it's quite a, a lot like uh, the Alexander the Great page, so there are labels and definitions. In this case, since it's a, a mint, it also has a latitude and longitude that we can make use of. And uh, there are also other uh, URIs for um, Aratus and other information systems um, externally. So we can start to link between themisma.org and other, um, other uh, databases. Uh, there's also a broader concept which allows us to link um, uh, places together hierarchically. So we can say that Aratus is within uh, Phoenicia, and then Phoenicia is within a larger region, so on and so forth. Um, there are also monograms uh, defined in the Hellenistic royal coinages. So there's a URI for price monogram 118 uh, that you can find. And there's also a map here showing where this particular monogram was minted. So it exists only in Aratus. And uh, it has points for ports that it appears in. And below that, you can see a, a network graph between this uh, monogram and other monograms that have been associated with it. So you can look for patterns in, um, in, in these monograms. So as I said, uh, we have coins, types, monograms, hordes, and finds all together as different uh, disparate information systems, but all interlinked. And all of these are linked um, thoroughly with numisma.org concepts um, and modeled into uh, data defined by uh, numisma.org as a standard data model and then integrated into uh, something called a triple store, which I'll get into soon. So to go back to this um, example of a price, uh, price 3309, we can say um, in human, sort of human knowledge, um, that price 3309 is a coin type. It has a mint of Aratus. Uh, it has a stated authority of Alexander the Great. So these are simple statements of fact. I guess to some degree they may be subjective based on uh, interpretations. But we have these statements that consist of three parts, a subject, a predicate, and an object, much like human speech. And this is a simple statement of linked data um, in three parts, which is called a triple. So if we convert these human statements into a machine statement, uh, according to something called uh, resource description framework or RDF, uh, this is what it looks like at its basic machine readable state. So, each of these uh, statements, the subject here, is defined by URI. The predicates are all defined by URIs as well within an ontology. And an ontology is a, a computational expression of, of human knowledge. Um, so these are all URIs. And an ontology in RDF is also defined as RDF as well. And then the third part of the statement, the object can be a URI that links to something else. 
uh, which will then also have its own set of triples, or the object um, of a triple can be a string of characters. So for example, um, at the very bottom here, we have price 3309 has, you know, this predicate here, which uh, if you expand it out, it's got a preferred label of price 3309 within in quotation marks. So we can simplify this uh, quite a bit with something called the terse triple language or turtle for short. So instead of having URIs really long, uh, difficult to read URIs for each component of a triple, you can define a prefix within the top of your uh, data document where you define uh, SCOS, S-K-O-S, or the Simple Knowledge Organization System ontology with this URI. Uh, same thing with uh, Namisma namespace and the Namisma ontology are all defined by a, a URI prefix, which allows us to simplify the next lines of this as uh, RDF type, uh, price 3309, has mint within the Numisma ontology of uh, numisma.org slash ID slash Aratus, so on and so forth. So Numisma has stated authority of Alexander the Third. Price 3309 has a preferred label of Price 3309, obviously, within the English language. And you can certainly have more than one language uh, as necessary. So we can also simplify this even further. Um, simplify this syntax by using semicolons to separate um, statements um, about the same subject here. So we can just use semicolons, define the subject first here with the CRI of price 3309, and then have, you know, has, it's a coin type, has a mint of Aratus, has a stated authority of Alexander III. Uh, and so a, a, a coin type can have an obverse and a reverse, and then the obverse can have information about it on the obverse. So the, uh, the portrait or symbols or the type description, of legend, that sort of thing. So in this case, we have uh, price 3309 has a reverse, which has a control mark defined by this monogram URI, and it also has a legend. So, that was a really basic snippet of uh, a turtle snippet of a coin type. So this is a, a turtle snippet of a coin which links to that coin type. So within our system, we have, uh, within Mantis, we have a URI defining a coin in our database. Uh, it is defined as a numismatic object. It has a type series item. So it has a coin type linked to price 3309. It belongs to a collection, which is the Numisma URI for the American Numismatic Society. It has a weight, uh, which is 17.29 uh, grams, which is a decimal number. It has a diameter. It has a title. Uh, and it is part of uh, a coin hoard, which is coinhoards.org um, slash ID slash IGCH 1664, which is uh, yeah, one of the larger hordes that we have at the ANS. Um, and as well as coin types and uh, specimens, um, the MISMA concepts, of course, have uh, are defined in RDF as well. So we can have this linked data for Aratus. We define it as a mint. It has a label of Aratus in English and Arawad in French. It has a broader concept of Phoenicia uh, which is the parent region, and it has a location on Earth, and that location has a latitude and longitude. So from that point, from linking to a coin to a type to the mint of Aratus, we can say that this coin was minted at this latitude and this longitude without having to embed that geographic information directly into the coin record. So now uh, I will be introducing the Sparkle aspect of, uh, of this talk. So I'm going to close 
the yeah close the presentation and then switch back and forth between um namisma.org sparkle endpoint and and this so a sparkle endpoint is um a protocol um for querying linked data so sparkle stands for sparkle protocol and rdf query language so the structure of a Sparkle query is very similar to the syntax of Turtle, uh, which I showed you before. So I think it's um, once you kind of wrap your head around the semantics of um, encoding objects in Turtle, then it's um, easier to wrap your head around um, how to actually query this information. So um, in the Sparkle endpoint, we have uh, prefixes and uh, that define different ontologies. Um, we're selecting uh, basically an asterisk means anything, um, any kind of information at all from a subject, a predicate, and an object. And these are all variables. So there are no limitations on what subjects might be uh, might result or predicates or objects or whatever. So it's really the most generic um, kind of query that you can submit to a to a Sparkle endpoint. And so if I submit this, um, there's a limit of 100. So you wouldn't want to submit this query uh, without any kind of limitations because there are um, mil millions and millions of, of triples within the Sparkle endpoint and uh, the query would probably just stall out before it actually gave you any information. So um, the default layout when you use the Nomisma Sparkle endpoint is basically a table like this. But at the top of every query is a download link. So you can download this as a CSV file and then load it into Microsoft Excel or something else like that in order to perform more sophisticated um, uh, visualizations or calculations or what have you. So the next thing I'll show is um, how to get all coins of price 3309. So if we start with a variable coin, so that's basically any coin using the predicate or property NMO has type series item, which we saw in the example above. Um, so a coin has a type series item of the URI for price 3309. So if I plug that into the query here, it will just get a list of all of the coins, um, just the URIs and nothing else that are related to that coin type. Of course, we can do more sophisticated things uh, than that, but that's really one of the basic ways to get some information out. So now we want to do something a little bit more sophisticated. So we want all the coins from price 3309, but we also want to get the collection that they belong to, and the collection is a variable, so it could be, you know, it could be anything. And we also want to get um, any of the weights out for those coins. So I submit that query and you can see the majority of the coins for this type are from the ANS, but we also have, uh, let's see, Berlin, British Museum, the Ashmolean, and then we have um, coin you know, weights as well. Um, it should be noted in this query that um, these are all required elements. Uh, so we're only getting results that have have a weight function. So um, in this next one, we want to make some of these variables optional. So we want to get any coin from price 3309 that has a collection, but also we want uh, a weight if it's available, a diameter if it's available, and optionally if it is part of a coin hoard and see what that does.
So now our result set uh, includes much of the same the same coins, but as you can see in this instance, there are some coins where the uh, diameter hasn't been encoded or didn't come through uh, that collection that shared their data with us. So we have some blank spaces for diameters. And you can also see that uh, only four of these um, coins come from hoards. And you can click on a link here and it'll take you to coinhoards.org and you can take a look um, at what that hoard is. Uh, the contents, and also you can page through uh, the coins that are actually part of these hoards. So I'll go back to our query. And the next thing we're going to do is expand this query just a little bit further to get more information about the hoards themselves. So we want to get, like before, we want to get the coins from price through 309 with the weights, diameters, and hoards uh, that are optional. But this time we want to expand the hoard query to include the label of the hoard. We want to get the find spot uh, of the hoard here with this uh, um, complex predicate. Um, we want to get the place name of the hoard as well. So what it or what the, the place is called where the hoard was found. And we also want to get the latitude and the longitude of the hoard. Additionally, what we're doing here in this one is um, we're also, I guess it's not, I guess there's no start there. Um, I guess it doesn't matter. Um, okay, so I'm pasting this in. And now what we see in our results set is that we're expanding the information for the hoards. So we can see this hoard has a label of IGCH 1670. It was found um, at a place that's defined by this URI in geonames.org, which is a really large scale geographic database. This is in uh, Egypt, a place in Egypt, and it has a latitude and longitude. So we have able to extract all of the geographic information related to these hordes from this query. So at that point, you can kind of see if we go to price 3309, um, if we go to price 3309, we can now see that um, we have some points uh, on this map for these hordes. So that query that I showed you is the basic structure for uh, developing this mapping interface. So basically what we're doing from this information here is taking the resulting link data uh, that underlies this. Now what you see here is an HTML web page. What we're taking for the map is taking that um, link data from this Sparkle query result, and then turning that into something that can be displayed uh, in the web browser as a map. All right, so next, we're gonna increase the complexity just a little bit of this previous query. So we know that price 3309 is minted in Aratus and it's a tetradram. By means of linking from a type to numisma concepts for different uh, categorical attributes, we can um, expand our query to look for um, any type, using type as the variable now, any type that has a mint of erratus, and that type is also uh, a tetradram. We can now uh, get, a, get a query that will show us um, all of the coins that were minted in Aratus that were also tetradram. 
And what we've also done with this one is we also extracted the, um, as you can see, we extracted the start date for the types, and then we ordered them by ascending order. So that's lowest to highest. So now we have a really large result list of hundreds of coins that are tetradrams from Aratus organized chronologically uh, from the earliest to the latest and all of the associated hoard metadata for those coins, if applicable. So the next thing we're going to do um, is introduce a, a slightly a slight limitation to this because there are so many hundreds of results in the set. It's also possible to limit your results by putting limit a limit here with a, an arbitrary number of your choosing. Um, I think the system is pretty good at dealing with anything that's in you know a thousand or less results. Um, any more than that, it becomes somewhat in, inefficient. So we can limit our results set here to the first 25. And the way of um, paging through that, so if we introduce an offset, if it's an offset of zero, that means the, the very beginning. So what you see is um, what was in the previous query. But if we change the offset to 25 on a limit of 25, the next uh, 25 rows will will appear. So this is one way of creating um, paginating through a really large response set. All right. So the next thing we're going to do after dealing with some of the, um, uh, the geographical um, solutions is take a look at metrical analyses. So we're um, going to go back to um, dealing specifically with price 3309. And what we want to do here is find all the coins um, from that coin type and uh, also extract their weights out. And what we're going to do with the weights, instead of getting a list of coins with their weight, we are defining uh, this. So we're using an average function to average all of the weights from those coins and then responding with a variable called average. So it's, it's fairly basic, uh, basic means of performing a metrical analysis. So from the results set, you see that the average weight of this particular coin type is 17.1 17 um, 17 grams, more or less. We can, of course, make this slightly more uh, complicated, uh, much like the result above, where instead of querying on, on just price 3309, we'll just query for types from Aratus uh, that are also tetradrams, and then get all the coins that are related to any type from Aratus that's a tetradram, and then average those weights instead. And in this case, it's about 17 grams or so. So the average weight for price 3309 is just slightly, uh, slightly above the average weight for other tetradrams of Aratus. But not, you know, not enough to be a huge, a huge difference. So the next thing we want to take a look at uh, that's pretty useful is performing a query that's based on uh, geographic hierarchy. So we want to find any type that has a mint, uh, and the mint is a variable in this case. And we want to expand that mint to say, this mint has a broader concept of Ionia. And the, we use the plus here uh, which is in the Sparkle syntax called a property path. And what that does is it's an iterative process. So it looks 
from the lowest to the highest in the hierarchy um, up until it reaches Ionia. So this is a way of basically infinitely looking through the hierarchy for any child or you know ch any child of that child of Ionia. So I'll put, paste that. And the response is going to reply with the type and the mint. So you can see here we have a list of uh, types from Pella and the associated mint that's from Ionia. So we have uh, Ephesus and Miletus and, and Chios and whatnot. Now we can expand the complex. Um, the complexity of this a little bit by doing something called a union query. In this case, we want to find all of the um, all of the types that are from any any mint in Ionia, and we want to combine that query with any mint that's located in Lydia. Um, what we also want to do is get the start dates for those types, the start issue date and then order that issue date by uh, ascending order. So that would be the oldest to the newest coin types. So now we have uh, a larger list here of all the types that include um, any mint located in Lydia or in, in um, or Ionia. I can undo the limit here and it will give a fuller list. So you can see there actually a really large number of, of coin types uh, produced in either one of these regions. And this list also includes Roman imperial coins, not just Hellenistic ones. All right, so now we're going to get into some of the more interesting uh, basic queries for doing distribution. Um, so in this case, we want to do a distribution of staters by authority. So we want to find all the types that have a denomination of stater. And then we also want to use um, has authority of a, of a variable. So that will get any authority at all. We want to define that authority as a person. So we want to exclude anything that might be linked specifically to a, a larger political entity. And what we want to do here is get the, the authorities, all the list of authorities and the number of types that each of those authority produced. And we're going to order these um, from largest to smallest in descending order by the number of types. So you can see from this query that Alexander the Great produced uh, the the largest number of staters, um, followed by Philip III and Tol the Ptolemies and so on and so forth, until we get down to just a few authorities who uh, issued staters. Based on the data that we've aggregated so far. Now, if we want to um, filter that result set somewhat to only include Seleucid authorities. Um, as I showed in the first screen of um, earlier of uh, Alexander the Great and his relationship to the Macedonian kingdom, uh, so too do other Hellenistic rulers linked to a, a higher political entity. So in Namisma, there is a, a Namisma URI for the Seleucid Empire. So all the Seleucid kings and also women who appear on coins, uh, the empresses also appear uh, 
uh, as connected to the Seleucid Empire. So in this case, it's basically the same query, except we want to refine the authority just a little bit more to say they have a membership uh, within an organization, and that organization is the Seleucid Empire. And now you can see from the results that uh, Seleucus uh, the first created the largest number of staters. And uh, these are um, just all the Seleucid kings and in, in their production of staters. Now I'm going to show something that uh, can't be done through user interfaces in in our projects. So what, what you've seen so far are some of the really basic types of queries uh, that underlie ochre and Hellenistic royal coinages for producing maps, for doing metrical analyses and creating charts, for comparing average weights of a type with other kind of related typologies, as well as the basic distribution visualizations of creating charts showing, you know, the deities that um, Augustus issued um, on his coins or whatever. This is something a little bit different because Ochre and Crow um, are kind of restricted within their own user interfaces. So when you're using Ochre, to perform a metrical analysis, it's only observing Roman imperial coins. So that's kind of filtered. So within the MISMA, if you want to do a comparative analysis of late Roman Republic or, and early imperial coinage to see a, of, uh, how the average weight of a denarius might have changed from, uh, from the late Republic to the early Augustan period, or things like that. You have to be able to use the Namisma uh, Sparkle endpoint in order to construct those queries yourself because there's no purpose-built user interface that actually spans both Ochre and Crow simultaneously. Not yet anyway, it, it could be done in theory. But what I wanted to show in this query is that we're querying all of the Namisma data all at once. So it includes uh, ochre and crow typologies, as well as all of the physical coins that are connected to those typologies. So in this case, we want to find all of the all of the types that are a denarius um, and get a distribution or get a list of deities that appear on these uh, denarii. But instead of focusing just on ochre or just on crow, we're limiting our query by date. So we're filtering by date, starting with 50 BC, which is represented as a negative, um, a negative number here. And we are extending um, the query to the, the latest point being um, 69 AD. Um, so basically from the late Republic until the end of the Julio-Claudian era. And in our query, since deities typically appear on the front or the back of the coin, we're performing a union query that will query types uh, that have an obverse um, and that, that obverse has a portrait and whatever that portrait is on the front or the back is defined as a deity. So we're excluding any kind of portrait that's a, a person uh, essentially from this. Uh, so only deities. Um, which is uh, generally restricted um, to Republican coins for the obverse, obviously. And we're also combining the obverse uh, queries for deities with reverse, um, reverse uh, depictions that include deities as well, which is the most common way that they appear. So we're basically getting all of the a list of deities that appear on obverse and reverse from 50 BC to 69 AD and getting the, the label for those deities. 
And what we're going to get in this particular query is Somewhere there's an error here, but don't seem to be seeing it though. Is it extra bracket there? Is it? Uh, you know what it is? Uh, I don't think I included the date. Oh, wait, I did. An extra bracket. No, I don't see it. Let me see if I can skip to the next one. Hmm. No, I don't know. Well, I guess that query didn't work, but what it would have done is um, basically given you a list of hundreds of coin types, you know, from 50 BC to 8069 with the deity that that appeared on it. Um, the next query, which is the last one, which also doesn't seem to be working correctly. Um, was basically to create a, a distribution chart. So it would just tell you um, what the deities were and how many types those deities appear on and Mars appears on the largest number of, of types in that time period, which makes a lot of sense because um, Mars appears uh, disproportionately compared to other deities on Augustan coinage in particular, um, with Mars Altor and, and, and whatnot. Uh, so that's essentially the, um, the end of the query example portion. I have... Um, a few links in this PDF that can take you to some related materials. So I gave a similar talk in 2015, which has been recorded on YouTube. Uh, and there are various Sparkle examples uh, related to that. Um, there's also some Sparkle tutorials for wikidata.org, which is the link data backend for Wikipedia. Um, but at this point, um, I'm happy to take any questions or if you have any really specific um, uh, queries that you'd like answered, I could help uh, you know, put those together. But um, yeah, I, th I think um, this is a, it's been a general introduction to how we structure numismatic data as linked data and how we publish that online and make use of it within um, the linked data environment that Numismo provides us through the Sparkle endpoint. And so this is really a core piece of infrastructure that we've been developing with our colleagues for the last uh, more than 10 years now, and uh, really underpins uh, almost every digital numismatics project on the web, not just at the ANS, but at a lot of other institutions as well. So it's a, um, huge uh, backbone of, of the discipline at this point. So um, thanks a lot for your attention and um, perhaps sometime in the, in the future, in the next couple of months, if there's another long table uh, opportunity, um, we could do something perhaps a little more hands-on where you, you come to me with uh, questions you have and then we can kind of, you know, do some real time querying and see how that works out. But thanks a lot for your attention.
Let me see them. Are there any questions? Any comments? Uh, if I may, add a question and comment. Yeah, sure, of course. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this presentation. I thank you very much for um, a Mantis uh, system. I find it extremely useful. I do research in, uh, in numismatic iconography and uh, there is other applications and other platforms and it's possible to compare, like for example, uh, what people do in Stadtliche Museum in Berlin and British Museum and uh, in the National Library in France and Mantis, I find the most uh, user-friendly application to, to use. So thanks, thank you very much for that. In terms of this um, uh, application, what you work in, is um, I have impression it's some sort of back end of the process. So it's, uh, you feel very comfortable navigating and showing this thing, but how, um, how it can be useful for just average researcher, for example, like me doing research on numismatic iconography. I have some knowledge of, of, of coding and there's a lot of codes you've shown and you know, I, I'm familiar with this, but it seems like for most of the people it will be just overwhelming. Uh, so in terms of if it's back end, do you think about developing something more, um, I guess, user friendly or, you know, designed for average user? Thank you. Yeah, well, the, the front ends for these are essentially ochre and Hellenistic royal coinages and whatnot. So the vast majority of users who uh, are using these data don't realize well, because it is a back end generally, that um, it's really a major component that underlies um, the other typology projects as well as coin hoard projects that already have um, uh, intuitive user interfaces built on top of them. Um, there has been um, there has been an interest, I think, in developing more generalizable um, user interfaces directly on top of the Numisma data without having these sort of separate typology uh, websites. Uh, it's really just a matter of not having really the time or the funding to build um, something directly on top of Numisma. So yeah, I mean, that's essentially what it boils down to. Just to follow up, because it seems like, again, from my own personal experience, working with a huge uh, amount of data on, uh, on like iconography, numismatic iconography, there's quite a bit of duplication. So it seems like same, same coin being replicated, data being replicated in all different places. So um, it seems like numisma potentially can be some sort of universal umbrella providing references to particular records and different collections. Is it sort of the way it's going? So it's going to be universal, like ultimate authority of on the numismatic typology. Is it- Yeah, the, essentially okay. that is the way it is. Okay. That's the way it's going essentially. Mm -hmm. um, not everybody really needs to use numisma to, to define their own typologies, but it's a pathway into making data reusable uh, optimally and making it more accessible to people. Um, I think the, the multilingual aspect of Numisma data is really um, especially useful. We see um, in the analytics of um, Seleucid coins online specifically, a lot of users are from Turkey uh, because we have a, a Turkish interface and all the labels for numismatic concepts. Uh, we have Turkish labels for those um, extracted from Wikidata. Uh, same thing with um, larger amounts of uh, Arabic users using um, these systems as well because of uh, Arabic labels that we have within the MISMA. So I think um, this system allows us to answer a lot of really complex research questions that couldn't be done more than 10 years ago, as well as broadens access to 
uh, people living in countries where they can't get easy access to the English language materials. By materials, I mean the printed monographs, that is like RIC is very expensive and hard to get. And um, Ochre makes it possible to research and identify Roman Imperial coins a lot easier and more efficiently than ever before, I think. Uh, Ethan, I don't know if you uh, saw in the chat, there's a question from Daniel Wolf. He's asking, what happens in the unlikely event a dram has been inadvertently been entered as a tetradram or a price number has a typo? Uh, it's probably not that unlikely. I'm sure there are a lot of these. Um, um, I guess there's no feedback page contact form in Pella right now, but um, if you find an error, um, you should inform, if it's, if it's an error in the typology itself, um, we should be informed so we can fix the data. We also do have other instances where the cataloging for a partner collection is wrong, so they might have given the wrong price number to something. So then a coin that isn't, you know, price 3309 will show up on that page. And at that point, we really have to reach out to the curator responsible for that collection to have them change their, their cataloging and then re-ingest it in the system. But that process can often be really, really slow, um, especially for collections that don't um, have automatic exports directly into Numisma. In fact, in the what six or so years that Pella has been up, uh, we've gotten scores of um, emails from people who've noticed errors either in the typology or in the uh, individual specimens. So yeah. if you notice something, please uh, send either myself or Ethan an email and we can correct it. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Hi, I would uh, just like to thank Ethan for doing this. This is amazing. Thank you so much. I actually don't know anything about it. But um, our director of digital services um, was at this meeting. And I thank you so much for this information because we are transferring our uh, numismatic database into Cortex. I'm not sure if um, anybody is familiar with that. And we want to make it in a way that we can join the MISMA. Um, we have emailed you occasionally about some things, and I just wanted to say that you may be hearing from us <laughs> again, uh, but I'm really excited to be part of it. So thank you so much. Thank you. That's great, Marina. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I have a question, um, uh, Ethan. So you've got this. The set of attributes for for each object, you know, uh, diameter and weight and coining authority and so on. Um, what what's the process with it in Numisma for uh, you know uh, defining and and maintaining that that set of attributes? Because I'm I'm assuming they occasionally change or or, or are modified. Yes. Yeah, so. Um... So at that point, we would get an update of data from the source collection. So if, um, so if the British Museum changes their cataloging or, or whatnot, I think that you know, there, are, there are some institutions that weigh their coins, but they don't measure them. So there are a lot of coins that have weights, but no diameters. Um, and let's say if in the future that collection decides they want to go back and, and, and enter in diameters for all their collection, they would have to send us um, a data export from their database. And then we would reload that into Numisma. So we don't really go out and fetch the data from a partner. They basically they give us the data and then we re-ingest re it in the system. So. Off for the uh, the Berlin um, in Berlin Lunds cabinet they have a huge network of 
small um, uh, university museums in Germany and uh, their network has 20 some collections in it and they all use the same database system. So they're one of the ones who catalogs something and then re-uploads it very quickly. But then there are other institutions where it's a much more difficult pro um, prospect of getting their updated data. And, okay, so you've got, uh, so the queries you, you were showing us, they were going to some centralized database. They weren't They right. weren't going out to all the individual ones online and dynamic. No, no. So the Numisma Sparkle endpoint is essentially a centralized repository of linked data. Well, we don't we don't store people's images either. Uh, I didn't really show any examples, but we store the URLs of images on other people's servers. So don't, we don't back those up, but we do uh, ingest the link data for those collections and then keep it into a centralized area, which um, makes it a lot more efficient for querying. And where is that that centralized data uh, for Nomisma maintained? Um, who, who maintains those servers? Uh, the ANS does. So it's on the okay. ANS. Um, we just migrated to an Amazon cloud server. Sure. So uh, all of our NumaShare projects like Ochre and Crow and whatnot are on that server as well as um, Namisma. All right. Any other questions? not, I see we're uh, at the top of the hour. And um, again, would like to thank Ethan for his uh, great presentation. And I, I think we will um, try to follow up um, with more uh, or with Ethan again at some future date on a long table to uh, dig a little bit deeper into all of this. Um, thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.